welcome to the first Blue Knot event of the 2020-2021 season. First Blue Knot event of 5781. We are so excited that you're here. We're so lucky that we have Liz Bronson to kick it off. I'm going to give a quick bio for Liz and then let her take it away. So Liz Bronson is the owner of Liz Bronson Consulting, an HR and recruiting company helping tech startup teams maximize their hiring processes by identifying the right roles, asking the right questions, and collecting the important feedback to make the best hire. Liz is passionate around designing authentic, candidate-centric recruiting processes that match a company's culture. Since starting the company in 2013, she has helped her clients, including companies like Polymy, Zugata, SignalFX, Evernote, and Predict Spring, build their people practices around their values. Liz also does individual career and general management coaching and hosts the Real Job Talk podcast with her friend and colleague, Kathleen Troyer. Before being independent, Liz worked for nine years at VMware, building their product management and marketing teams, and was also a part of the HR team at Barclays Global Investors. Liz has lived in Austin for 13 years with her husband, who is in technical sales, and two kids. She's been involved with the Jewish community for about 10 years and has served on the Shalom Austin board, as well as the Women's Division Cabinet, Shalom Austin CEO Search Committee, and numerous committees at Temple Beth Shalom. I am so happy to introduce Liz Bronson. Thank you so much. So weird to hear it in words. Um, that's me, I'm Liz, and kind of as Alachua said, why am I qualified to be here at Blue Knot? Well, I am not technical. I tell people that I play someone technical on TV, but I have been in tech for about 15 years. And uh, the last seven and a half running my own recruiting consultancy and HR consultancy to help tech companies grow. So I've spent a lot of time at VMware and I've spent a lot of time with my other clients that you can see listed on the uh, slide above. Um, and I also do career coaching and just really love to help people through the kind of career job universe. So I was asked to come on today because jobs, careers, hiring, it's all kind of turned on its ear like everything else in 2020. And so to answer the question of like, how is hiring different in 2020? It is, and it's not. Um, in the beginning of COVID and March area, a lot of jobs put everything on hold, had to do furloughs and rifts and all kinds of things. Um, but seem, things seem to be opening up now as companies have either not done well and had to deal with that or have realized a steady state or a pivot and now need to grow growth in order to um, support that pivot. And so in the Austin area, there's a lot of tech jobs. Uh, developers are definitely in demand. Security is in demand. There's always need for IT sysadmins. Um, but when you're looking for a job, there used to be job events where you could get to know different companies and things like that. They're now online and a lot of networking events are now online, which is really different than walking in a room and having small talk because when you're online, kind of one person talks at a time or there are breakout rooms and maybe you go to a certain event in non-COVID world and you want to talk to somebody. And so you do, you find them, you talk to them. You can't do that in an online event. So networking and things like that are much more targeted and you have to reach out. You're not gonna bump into somebody. Um, something else that's really changed is a lot of jobs have gone remote. So companies that were all in the office, I think Microsoft just announced this week, they're not going back. Huge companies are all of a sudden remote. So you're living here in Austin, before you couldn't work for Microsoft at an HQ position. Now you can. So all these companies have opened jobs that you wouldn't have been at qualified for based on your location and now all of a sudden you are. So that's a cool thing that has changed in 2020. So let's say you're looking and what, how do you even go about it? Some people decide I'm miserable at my job. We've made it through COVID. My job's not going away, but I'm still miserable. I want to look, or some people have had their jobs impacted this year. What are your first steps? And no matter what your situation, I recommend 
doing some soul searching. And what that means is really spend some time thinking about what do you love about your job or like about your job? What do you not like? What have you liked about certain companies? What have you liked about certain managers? What have you like? Do you like big companies? Do you like small companies? Do you like commuting? Do you hate commuting? Um, and not only looking, asking yourself, but really asking what Kat and I on Real Job Talk call your board of advisors, people who care about you, people you've worked with before, but also people who just love you and want the best of, from you, for you. So saying to them, hey, what have you noticed about me in work? Oh, well, I've noticed that when you're working on strategic projects, you're super happy and have tons of energy. And when you're working on really mundane projects, you get really sluggish and are miserable to be around. It's a pretty good data point. You better know that before going in. And so based on those conversations, you put together a list of what you're looking for in a job. And there are some things you may want to be able to compromise on, some things not. Um, and then after you've soul searched, you wanna review your resume and your LinkedIn profile and make sure someone else is looking at it too. We often overlook typos because we read them in our head the way they're supposed to read, but someone else will see that you wrote it instead of if or something like that. Um, make sure on your resume, you've listed the impact that you've had on different organizations and on your LinkedIn profile too. I use those two kind of interchangeably. Make sure that someone searching for someone like you can find you. And what does that mean? It means keywords. Make yourself searchable. Uh, make sure that your technologies are listed. But know that anything you put on your resume is right for questioning. So if you put that you are a C-sharp developer, you better be able to answer questions about C-sharp. So if you have keyword soup on there, but really don't know everything that you put, that's going to trip you up in the interview process. But review that resume and LinkedIn, make sure it's sharp, make sure it, it says who you want and look at jobs. And I'm, of course, right now I'm doing the like super fast version of this. There's lots more to it, but look at some jobs that look interesting and kind of look at your language and make sure they mirror each other. Um, that is critically important because the person looking at the resume wants to see exactly what you're looking for. Um, another thing to do is to update your certifications. Your languages are modern. If you need to take a quick online course to learn a new programming language that you're seeing all over, do it. So make sure that you are the best fit for the kinds of jobs you want. Um, and lastly, and this is where we're going to start into the job search part, look at your network. Who's working at a cool place? Who's well-connected? Um, how, and then think to yourself, like, how have I gotten jobs in the past? I had a career coaching client once who he was like, look, I'm looking for a new job. And we looked at his past and he had gotten four out of six jobs in his life through one contact. So I asked the brilliant question, have you called that contact? He hadn't. Guess what? He called him. The person hooked him up with a job. It, like, so you think about this has worked really well for me in the past. Let me try to recreate that. And then once you've kind of put together a list of people to reach out to, people that might be at interesting companies or doing interesting things, it's time to reach out authentically. And a quick how-to on that one. Um, so let's say you're really interested in working for Facebook and you learn that a colleague that you worked with five years ago worked at Facebook great. You want to reach out and say, hey, colleague, how, how's it going? Do you have 10, 15 minutes to talk? Colleague probably will. You make sure to say, how are you? How's the pandemic treating you? And then, you know, ask about what's it like to work there? What's been going on over there? How have they pivoted? Um, and then you can lead that to, you know, I saw this job that looked really interesting. Do you know anything about it? I really encourage people whenever they can to be an employee referral. And what that does is it gets you a little star next to your name. Does it get you the job? No, but it is much more likely to get you at least that first 
conversation. It gets you in the door. And people want to refer people, especially good people, because usually there's cash compensation attached to it. So yes, you may be a friend of a friend, but all of a sudden you're the best candidate I've ever seen because I get a thousand bucks if you get hired. And so I'm more than happy to introduce you into my workplace if I think you're going to be a good fit. Now, another thing that's totally changed in 2020 is that we don't interview a person anymore. Who needs a person? And so, you know, I kind of wrote interviewing from your bedroom tongue in cheek, but then I say, try not to. Try to be in a space that's quiet. That is, you know, and that said, it's 2020. If a dog barks, a dog barks. Mine do all the time. Um, but try to find a quiet space, nice neutral background. Try to get the kids and the pets outside if you can and just be comfortable. And then before you interview, just like you would anytime, be prepared. If you are a technical person and can download the technology because it's open source, do it. If you, you want to do your research and you want to have questions, um, it, I, what, I, as a recruiter who talks to a bunch of people every day, when you ask a question that I can Google in two words or less, what, you know, what funding round is Pulumi? You can look that up. Ask me questions that you can't Google search because then I feel like you prepared, you cared, you wanted to know what it's like. Um, and you want to make sure you're the person driving your, your job search, even if you don't feel that in control of it. And so you need to make sure it's a fit for you. This is your life that changes. Nobody that you're interviewing with, their lives don't change if you get hired, but yours does. So you really want to think about questions that you need the answers to, to find out if it's a mutual fit. And my last tip, it's kind of silly again, but smile. This is how they're getting to know you. They're getting your vibe. If you're like this, they're going to get this vibe. If you're like this, they're going to get this vibe. Now, that might be a little too extra for some developers, but you want to make sure that you're projecting your best self, even though you're on the Zoom and so it's harder to do in person. So try for the eye contact when possible, try for the smile. It does go a long way. People ask me a lot, how do I know what a company's really like? And that's funny because the companies spend a lot of money on employment branding. We're so fun, we work hard, we play hard, we give back, we do all the great things. And you don't know if that's true or not. Glassdoor is great, but the results are really manipulatable. Companies often give out gift cards to people who write five-star reviews. They offset the reviews. And while I'm not super negative, like I read the negative ones and take those into account much more than the positive ones because the positive ones can be manipulated. But the best way to find out what a company is really like is to talk to people. Who do you know that works there? It goes, do you know a friend of a friend? If a friend of a friend works there, you can say, hey, could you introduce me? And maybe they would give me 10 minutes to talk about their experience. So when you get that 10 minutes, ask really deep, good questions. Like, tell me about your last big project. How do they divide up responsibilities? How do you keep everyone updated? How do, they, how do teams work there? How many hours do you usually work in a week? On vacation, do they expect you to log in? How often? Things like that are gonna really teach you what it's really like to work there. And then you, what you would love to do, and I think you can ask this during the interview process if you're close to an offer or have an offer, ask to talk to someone in a similar role. Why not? Hey, can, is there someone else at the company who's doing what I'm doing? Could I talk to them? The company's gonna want them to sell you. You're gonna want them to tell you what it's really like. And the conversation should happen pretty easily. Um, my last tip on how finding a, out what a company's really like, find someone who left and ask them about it. They've got nothing to lose. So they, now you have to take into account they may be bitter and negative and their experience may have nothing to do with what yours would be. 
But if you have any questions, talking to someone saying, I pick up on the fact that I think they all work like 90 hour weeks. Is that true? Let's find out the truth. And so I'll leave this up as other good places to get info, but I kind of wanted to do that quick dive because you all have put together some great questions. And I, this is an information session for you to get at least my opinion on things that you really want to know. So with that, I'll kind of take a breath and turn it over to Ariel for my hot seat. Well, thank you, Liz, for, for the uh, rapid fire run through of uh, what it's like to be looking for, for new roles in this environment. Um, before we jump into Q&A, um, thank you for joining us, all of our guests. Um, if you've submitted uh, questions during your registration, um, we will get to them. Can everybody see me? I just did something bad on my computer. There we go. Um, we will get to them in the Q and A. But if you have anything pressing right now, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll get started with the with the list that we've built. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you if you have something. All right. Well, hopefully, uh, some of these questions will will whet your appetite and uh, inspire some 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 greatness. So, let's start, uh, Liz, with. Um, Let's go back to the interviewing uh, since we kind of uh, talked a little bit about that. Um, how does one in this environment, especially when the interviewing is not in person, um, stand out, um, you know, above and beyond their peers in Zoom? Um, and maybe there's a, a corollary to that. Um, what makes you look a lot worse than your peers, uh, even in inadvertently? That's a great question. Um... I think being prepared makes you stand out. The, oh, I haven't had time to look at the website. Like, great. All right, now I have to spend my time telling you what you could have learned in five minutes of looking at a website. I'll be honest, like in today's day and age, information's at our fingertips. So being completely unprepared when there's a planned interview is, it does not help you. The people that come with really good questions, they stand out because they're curious. The people who have downloaded, the technical people who have downloaded the product and who come to interviews with suggestions. I have candidates who have been like, um, I entered I entered a request or I, I, put, I put in a, I found an error in the docs. I'm like, you're the best, you're my favorite. So really being prepared, I think makes you stand out also I mean, I, it sounds cheesy, but smiling and being friendly. If you're talking to the first person, that recruiter, I might talk to four or five, six people in a day. So they all tend to blend together. So being friendly, being human, it does kind of stand out. Um, on the surfacey stuff, you know, I said, don't do it with your messy bed in the background or something like that. And you also don't need to wear a suit. You're in your house. Everybody knows it, you know? So, but being presentable, the people who I feel like they just got out of bed and they're like, oh, hi. oh yeah, I just had this. I'm like, that's memorable too, but not in a good way. So think of it as if you were going into an office in order to have a conversation. That's really helpful. Um, but being prepared, knowing your stuff, being able to talk about yourself and your experience and your impact in a really succinct way. The people who drone on and on and on and don't answer the question, they don't get that far. So make sure your story's crisp and make sure you're prepared. I think there's also preparation to be ready with examples is helpful too. All right. Um... Moving on, um, we had another question that was asked um, regarding resume advice. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it looks like this, uh, the person who asked this question, um, you know, maybe had different types of professional roles or they've shifted uh, some of their responsibilities over time. Uh, and they're looking for, uh, well, the question is resume advice when my career path has not had a clear trajectory or several unrelated jobs. So if you could speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. So you say resume, I say resumes. What kind of jobs are you qualified for? Probably more than one because you've done different things. And there's nothing wrong with having different versions of your resume. 
to apply for different jobs. And also every person in resume has a story. And what's most relevant is kind of your last five to 10 years of experience, depending on how experienced you are. Nobody cares what you did 20 years ago. It's sort of irrelevant. So the focus needs to be on what you've done that moves you towards where you want to go. So a resume isn't just a laundry list that keeps on growing. It's a breathing document that changes based on the direction you want to go. So I would challenge that person, first of all, probably have more than one resume, depending on the kinds of jobs you're looking at. But secondly, tailor the experiences you've had towards things that are relevant to where you want to go. Um. Maybe of those who are here and on video, a uh, show of hands of who is uh, at, at risk of uh, self-identifying if you're looking for a job. Um, you know, if you were to broadly categorize, uh, you know, questions that are more interesting to you, you know, whether it's interviewing or networking or maybe career development questions, um, who has more interest in interviewing type of uh, Q&A? Um, raise your hand for that. Okay. Um, Working or networking or remote working questions. Uh, how 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 do we do that in this uh, era of COVID? Okay, and then career development and career management questions. Okay, so I'll focus on uh, sort of more of interviewing and remote working. Um, uh, I guess uh, next question, um, if we don't have any. Uh, from the, from the group, um, do you have any recommendations to recent graduates um, and or young professionals um, mm -hmm. wh while they're navigating their job search process uh, during this time? God, I feel so badly, honestly, for the new grads um, and for the young professionals who I know many, many, many years ago when I was a young professional, I learned so much from being in the office and from having colleagues around me and just from hearing other people and all of that. And I think that there's, there's that skill of having to ask for help probably more than is comfortable when you're remote and on your own. It's just, I feel for those kids. Um, that being said, all the same rules still apply. And there are jobs that are looking for young grads. There are programs. I would probably encourage young grads in tech right now to probably go for the bigger companies because they're able to pivot and educate and, and train more holistically uh, than the startups that are like, jump in and do it. Um, that could be really intimidating when you've got really senior devs and you're a newbie like, I don't know what I'm doing. So there are jobs out there. It's, it is, it's tough. As a young as a young grad right now, and luckily for new grads in tech, it's a lot easier than new grads that are coming out with English degrees. Um, it's there's still a need for tech jobs, um, and there are jobs posted every single day. There are you know local jobs, there are temp jobs. One thing to do as a younger professional is to try to get temporary positions that could then turn into something more that can be a helpful way in but it's it's a tough one because of that remote piece right now um i guess while we're on uh you know looking for uh new roles or interviewing for roles um let's maybe address uh, the flip side of, of the hiring uh, equation. Um, if you are looking for talent or you're a hiring manager, how does, how does the COVID environment change how you've approached you know, finding, finding people? Well, first the remote piece, like all of a sudden companies that were all in and they would be meeting people and the person would have to come into the office, it's remote. So first the manager has to figure out how am I going to manage the team remotely. Um, so that's a big change, right? Um, after that, it's, you're going to really be experience based, you're going to be spending a lot of time with the person in 
interviews and on Zoom call, you want to be on video with them to kind of see how they interact, to see how they are as a team member. But And you're going to really want to, if your team is remote and going to be remote for the foreseeable future, you really want to take a lot of time. I spend a lot of time with people now talking about how does remote, how do you make remote work for you? What's working for you? What doesn't? How do you collaborate? How do you ask questions? Like finding out what their remote self is like to make sure that that's a fit for the team. Um, listening to their questions. There's a lot of things that are going to be the same, like listen to the questions they ask and things like that. But as a hiring manager, it's somehow stranger when you're hiring people you've never met. But it's where we are. And so you want to be asking those behavioral questions that make sure they have the experience that you need. And you want to ask how they figure things out when they don't have the cubicle mate behind, beside them and how they're going to fit with the team. And maybe there are a couple extra interviews for more people's viewpoint on the person. But you also have to keep in mind different people are different types of communicators. So someone really introverted doesn't always interview well, but they could be an amazing employee. So you have to keep those things in mind as well. I imagine that is a, that is a very challenging uh, nut to crack um, when you're trying to build teams that right now are remote, but you know, someday we won't be. Um, and I, I would imagine overlooking you know, people who, who bring value to the team, um, you know, but maybe don't present it as well on Zoom um, is, is a risk, so. But that's uh, where like discussion. your tech assessments and like all the things you do. So let's say you're hiring a full stack engineer. You're going to still do a tech assessment. You're going to see how they present it. You're going to see what questions they ask. You're going to give them problem questions. You're going to ask them about their career and different choices that they've made. You're going to ask about different technologies. So you're still going to do the same thing. It just won't be across the table from someone. But then it, the onus is on the hiring manager when they bring someone onto their team to make sure they're incorporated, to make sure that they are doing virtual copies with people cross-functionally and on the team, to make sure they have a buddy that they can ask questions in a you know, private environment, to make sure they're on Slack and welcomed. So there's a lot on the manager to make sure that person is integrated into the team, especially if they're a new person on a really established team. Good stuff. Um... Let's maybe move on to uh, the, the work life of COVID employees um, and how we work and network uh, in this environment. So um, you, you s said earlier in the presentation that, you know, nowadays it's not like you're going to bump into somebody at a coffee shop or, you know, there's no water cooler um, and there's no popping your head into somebody's office. Um, do you have any tips or tricks and what is the best way uh, that people can network uh, or meet their coworkers in per when, when you can't do it in person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you create those individual connections that um, suddenly are all digital? And companies are getting really creative. Um, one of my clients, Palumi out of Seattle, they use this thing called Donut that will match you up for coffee with different people. And they do virtual happy hours and they do virtual escape room. And like they're trying to do what they can to still build that team stuff. But honestly, it's not happening naturally. As you said, you're not running into anybody. You're not going to strategically walk by your future boss's office. You can't. Then you're, you know, stalker in their house. So you're going to have to reach out. And when you reach out, you just want to reach out. If you don't know them, you're reaching out saying, hey, I've been following you for a while. You know, asking someone for 10 minutes of their time and trying to keep it to 10 minutes, but asking for 10 minutes to talk about this subject. I'm really interested in your company. Do you have 10 minutes to talk? If not, is there someone better for me to talk with? Great. I wonder if you know the environment in some ways creates um, more of an incentive to be deliberate about your networking. 100%. Um, you know, yeah. Maybe that's, there's a silver lining there. Cause there's no like you're in the you're in the break room and you're like hey hey you know how about them cubs kind of thing like that's just not happening oh and by the way i saw you're hiring on your team oh yeah i am now it's hi i see you're hiring on your team i'd like to talk to you about the opportunity see if i can move into it 
it has to be more deliberate because it's just not going to happen naturally. Um, you know, on that, um, you know, with this new reality uh, and the networking discussion, what about large employers and how they've you know, adjusted uh, their employees' expectations of this new reality? Um, so the question is, can you give an overview of how different types of employers, large and small, have adjusted to this new reality of remote work? Every company's figuring it out for themselves. Um, some companies have gone full remote for the foreseeable future. Some have turned offices into rework type spaces so that people who need to get away or want to can under certain limitations. Every company is figuring it out for themselves. There's a great podcast series called Gray Matter by Greylock Partners, a VC out of Palo Alto. And they're talking to a bunch of different companies like they have the founder of Quora. And they have all these different founders talking about how they have pivoted their business and also pivoted their company in the COVID world. I highly recommend it for that question. Um, but honestly, it depends on your company and your culture and how big you are or small you are and nimble you are. And I think that for some companies that had like a hybrid thing going on, people are much happier because now that the person was always like, what did they say? You know, when everyone else was in the conference room, everyone's even like we are right now and can hear each other. And that's really nice. But also the side conversations are gone. So I think companies are figuring out their new normal. They haven't done it yet. They're trying to preserve culture. I think the companies that are going to come out best are the ones that are listening to their people and what they need, that are caring about their people and what they need, that are understanding that everybody is in a different situation. And while I may have a middle school running out of my house, someone else may have a daycare and everything in between. And that we're all facing different challenges or stresses or sick family members and all kinds of things. And so the companies that are choosing to be kind and understanding are going to come out ahead because people may not be leaving right now because there's uncertainty, but people who aren't treated well now will be leaving as soon as they can. And people who are tr being treated well and are talking to people who aren't, they're doubling down. So maybe following on and how, how remote workers are being treated, um, yeah. here are some hypothetical questions about what it looks like to be seeking a new role in this environment. Um, this question is related to compensation and other benefits. Does remote hiring change the dynamic for compensation or other ancillary benefits, i.e. allowances for tech upgrades, et cetera? And there's a follow-on question to that. Uh, is it reasonable for job seekers to expect higher compensation and or allowances given that they're providing their own workspaces? I think every company is different. I think the companies are figuring it out. The good, I've, heard, I've had a lot of companies that I've talked to who gave everyone a certain allowance to go upgrade their home office. And that's a nice perk. Um, I think companies are still paying competitively. It, it's still, there is a lot of talent out there. Uh, but for highly competitive jobs, they're still, they're still highly competitive jobs. I think compensation has changed. It's an open discussion. I think people's situations have changed, but I think it's fair to ask if, if the company is saying we're a hundred percent remote, I think it's fair for people to say, well, will you help me upgrade my home office? You know, I know some people have gone into their old office and they're like, I'm getting that monitor, bringing it home. Like, I miss my second monitor. Um, so I think there's a lot you can do there. Um, but every company is different. And so, again, the smart ones are figuring out how to keep their people happy and also set up their people for success. Um, I just heard of a company the other day that they in, their people get, like, slapped on the hand if they're caught checking their email during a vacation time. Like if they've taken a vacation time, they are not supposed to check email and people are not supposed to email them. And like, how cool is that in this world where we're, everything's accessible all the time? So there's a lot companies can do right now. They can, like I think it was Quora, that they set certain core business hours for the whole world. And then you could vary your time after that. 
So there's a lot of things companies can do to keep everybody working together. So maybe, um, you know, for, for some of us who know small business owners or startups, um, maybe can you speak to your own experience running your consultancy and your group? Um, what it has, uh, what COVID has done to change how you operate in your team? Well, the beginning of COVID, my stuff slowed down a lot and it actually allowed me to kind of assess my model and my team and I made some changes in my team. Uh, and now I think I have a better team. Um, as things ramped up, I feel like I'm much more prepared and have a better team working on my stuff. Um, I think, you know, all the things I said before is for the people that work for me, I make sure that they feel appreciated and taken care of and they have what they need. And, you know, one person who works for me, she now homeschools three kids. I'm really aware of that and um, kind about her time and when she can and when she can't do things. And I think just knowing where everybody is, is important. But for me, it's allowed me to kind of take stock and, and do some housekeeping that I was too busy to do. And now that I'm crazy busy again, like we're up and running. All right, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so this falls under a management and career development uh, type of question. So um, one's career development, should you be looking at how you are developing your own professional career differently in this remote work COVID environment? Um, and sort of secondary to that, are there any code words or buzzwords that have, have suddenly you know, percolated to the surface as must haves um, for folks looking for roles or folks hiring? And I'm keeping this to tech because clearly if we were, you know, a medical group, then I would have a different answer. Um, but honestly, career development, it's up to you. And if you've got a preschool in your house all of a sudden, and you're trying to get your day job done and you're just barely staying above water and you don't feel like you can take that extra class, I would say don't and take care of yourself. Like I am so big on self-care and making sure that you're set up for personal happiness and success. And maybe this isn't the year that you start the MBA program that you thought you were going to because of said daycare and everything else going on. So give yourself a little grace. Um, that being said, if you find yourself with extra time and there's that course you always wanted to take, I say go for it, absolutely. Um, and if you're internal and you've been wanting to go for that promotion and the opportunities there and you have time for it and think you can handle it uh, and manage your world, absolutely. Um, but I think that's a really personal decision and all of our lives have changed so much this year in unexpected ways that the five-year plan that we set five years ago is kind of on its ear right now. So that's a really personal question for an individual to assess their own situation. Let's see. Um, here's maybe a more challenging question and obviously we'll have different um, answers depending on the culture and environment of a workplace, but this is related to managing teams um, remotely and, and best practices or maybe worst practices. Um, what are you advising uh, how people can motivate and monitor the performance of their teams or employees in a remote environment? Um, how is that different now um, that you've seen uh, than you know, the way things used to be done? Well, honestly, if you had one-on-ones before, they're more critical now. So you need to be keeping the pulse of your team all the time, in person or not, uh, but especially now. And I'm going to go back to the thing. If you know somebody is struggling because they have a sick family member or kids, like giving that bandwidth and understanding is going to go a long way. But if you don't know what's going on, you can't support in the same way. So asking people what they need, and hopefully you have the established relationship that they know you're asking from a caring place is going to be really helpful. In terms of motivation, again, I hear you, I see you, I know you, let's figure out how to problem solve this together. Oh, you need to work early mornings and later afternoons because midday's crazy. Okay, so figuring out workflows 
that work for your people and understanding if some people on your team are 80% capacity, I think goes a long way. I think in terms of monitoring, it depends on the role and the tools that you're, that are available. But I think it's a great time to do some pulse checks. And I, you know, I'm a fan of surveying people to find out what's going on. Anonymous surveys are great for that. I'm also a big fan from an HR perspective of performance products like Culture Amp and Zugata is under Culture Amp. It was an old client of mine, but that they do for ongoing performance and they allow you to set your own goals and allow your peers to help you with performance and things like that make it so that that annual performance review isn't this like big horrible thing, but that it's all ongoing and you can kind of direct it. And I think it's also a good way to keep a better pulse on your team and what's going on. And if someone's, someone all of a sudden used to always be like top performer and all of a sudden, you know, their peers are saying like this person's never available and never at meetings, you can act on that more quickly if you have more accurate metrics. But the best way is to ask someone at, at the beginning of every one-on-one, -on -one, I ask people, how are you doing? Amazing. Yeah, I suppose that there's there's an important thing to acknowledge that when we're all remote, you know, people uh, can disappear off of our radars so quickly and suddenly, you know, a project can be three, four weeks behind and you just didn't know because you weren't there. Um, so yeah. it's important to check in. I but think I would we also have time. If a team member disappears, like if you're working on a project and there are five of you and only four show up, it, you got to escalate. Sure. Um, I guess uh, let's maybe, unless there are any last uh, last bids from the group, um, you know, last call for questions. Um, we've got uh, one or two more, but let's just stick to one um, to to close out this evening. Um, and again, we thank you for all of the knowledge and experience you've shared. I'm sure Alacha will have some words, but here we go. Last question for you. All right, drum roll. This is kind of going back to interviewing and job search. Uh, and maybe, um, you know, for any of us who might be looking to follow up with Liz uh, later on Slack, mm -hmm. how aggressive is too aggressive when asking for follow ups um, from your referral, referrals, friends, interviews, uh, et cetera? Yep. Um, do you send it and forget it? Or uh, what is too much? What is too little? Okay. You get, this is like always ask about like, can I follow up with the recruiter? Why are they ghosting me? Let's set the stage. I'm recruiter at VMware. I have 12 to 15 recs on my desk at any given time. Even if I have five candidates for each of those recs, do the math. There are a lot of people on my plate at any given time. Very often people get lost in the recruiter to hiring manager, what do you think process? Or in the after the interview feedback, especially if it wasn't a perfect fit, but we like them process. It is super hard for someone to keep track. They try, some don't, good ones do, but it's easy to get lost. Usually it's because someone's waiting for someone else. That being said, at the end of the call with the recruiter, hey, is it okay if I follow up with you in a week? What person's going to say no? Now, some people ignore emails. I've heard all the horror stories on earth. I'm sorry to anyone who has been burned by a recruiter in life. That said, absolutely you can follow up. I would say if you followed up, you can follow up with their hiring manager. You can follow up with the recruiter. Hey, hiring manager, it was so great speaking with you last week. Any updates on the position. Hiring manager be like, oh my God, I forgot to get back to Jimmy. And off you go. Or someone forgot to get back to you to tell you it wasn't a fit. If you don't hear back though, in two to three weeks, you can assume that you didn't get the job. And that stinks. But if you were, if you were an employee referral, they may not have visibility into where you are in the process. They can then ping someone so I would say read the room, don't be annoying, but be 
you're going to follow up. And especially like for people in sales, follow up is a sales skill. You absolutely want to follow up. Or I love it when I see candidates following up with my managers like, oh, you just got series B. That's so exciting. I still want to be part of that company. So it's an appropriate follow up that is based on something that happened in the news or something like that. But I would say if you've reached out two or three times and haven't heard back, that's your answer. It's, it's like that book that was many years ago, she's just not that into you. And again, I, I think every recruiter should get back to every candidate and they've spent time with you. You should say thank you, but, but not right now. It doesn't always happen. So absolutely follow up. And remember that people have a ton of candidates on their plate. You're, you're muted. I am. I had to do that once. Um, I think uh, that, that about wraps up our Q&A time. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Alachua, do you have any final parting thoughts? Yes. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much to Liz for kicking this off. Um, it was wonderful. And thank you to Ariel for leading such a masterful Q&A and for enabling you to answer even more questions for us. Um, you can hear more from Liz. Again, I wanna remind everyone that she does do individual career counseling. She has her podcast, The Real Job Talk podcast that you can listen to. Um, she has offered to share her slide deck. So when I send out the recording, I'll also send the slide deck out so you can review it if you want to. And um, then we've mentioned a little bit about the Slack workspace. So we have a Blue Knot Slack workspace um, that we use for a variety of things. But one of the things we use it for is after the event, if you have more questions or you think of something you want to ask Liz, she'll be monitoring it for a few days. I'm putting the link in the chat to join. The Slack channel, we're going to post the questions that we didn't get to tonight um, that Liz has graciously said she would answer to kick us off. But again, if you think of something in the next few days, um, feel free to stick it in there. Um, I'll send out the recording in the slide deck. And I want to remind everybody that the next Blue Knot speaker event is November 11th with Steve Schaefer, who's talking about startups and entrepreneurship. So more information will be coming out about that soon. Um, Ariel, did I forget anything? I think I hit it. Okay, good. <laughs> well, thank happy you. Happy New Year. Huh? Maybe a happy New Year. Oh yeah, happy New Year. This is our first kickoff. <laughs> happy 5781. Um, again, Liz, thank you so, so much. And thank you to all of you for spending your Wednesday night with Blue Knot. And I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.